Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Congressman Ro Khanna. Congressman, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Of course, we have a wide-ranging conversation today, so let's dive right into it, starting with the Senate Foreign Aid Bill, $95 billion bill that was passed on a bipartisan vote on Tuesday. So let's break down what's inside. Approximately $60 billion to Ukraine, $14.1 billion to Israel, $9.2 billion in humanitarian aid for Gaza, and over $8 billion to Taiwan. First, is this a package that you would support? I certainly support the aid to Ukraine. I think it is uh, urgent and uh, look forward to working to get a vote uh, on that. Uh, in terms of uh, aid to uh, Taiwan, I also support that. And in terms of aid to, to Israel, it has to be coupled with strong support uh, for humanitarian aid to Gaza. And we need to make sure that any aid is uh, uh, only defensive and not uh, being used to uh, uh, aid the uh, campaign in Rafa, uh, which the president, President Biden, uh, has called uh, uh, in not for not to happen. I do want to talk about Israel aid later, but are you saying that that would have to come with stipulations? Would you vote for this package as is, say it's introduced? Well, it's not going to be as is. Uh, the House will amend it, and I think it make it better. And, uh, but I want to get to, uh, obviously, a, a yes on Ukraine aid. I talked to two of your Republican colleagues over the past week, uh, Congressman Tim Burchett and Congresswoman uh, Anna Paulina Luna. Both said that they are full stop, absolutely not, no funding for Ukraine. What do you make of that? Well, it's unfortunate because if you talk to the experts, Ukraine has about two months uh, to uh, get artillery. Otherwise, we're handing Putin a victory and he's going to go into Donbas, Luhansk, uh, Odessa. Uh, and uh, really take over territory in a way that's illegal and going to uh, hurt Ukrainian lives. Uh, so I hope that uh, the United States patriotism can appeal uh, where Republicans, remember, they used to be the party that was against uh, uh, Russian imperialism. I do now want to move on to Israel. You voted no on the Israel-only aid bill, citing criticisms of Netanyahu's government and Ben Gavir's call, quote, for the mass expulsion of Palestinians, as well as humanitarian concerns. And you said this on the House floor, quote, I will not vote, I will vote no because it is painfully obvious to the entire world that what is needed today is a permanent ceasefire and a release of all hostages. So I do want you to break down the statement for us because as we know, Hamas is refusing to release the hostages. And as of now, Netanyahu has refused to stop the campaign until the hostages are released. So how would this work? Well, I think uh, the, the we, we need to look at Will Burns' leadership in Qatar and uh, uh, have an ag agreement that uh, you have the release of all hostages uh, and uh, a, a, a ceasefire. And that is what the United States uh, should state. I think if the president says that, uh, that he wants the release of all hostages from Hamas and he wants a permanent ceasefire, that uh, Will Burns will be able to uh, execute that. And how do we get to those negotiations? Because there have been temporary ceasefires, some hostages released. So how do you get to that goal? Well, the first is for the president to make it clear that that's what he wants. I mean, I think the American president is the most powerful person in the world. And when he says something to, in a decisive way, it usually uh, can happen. I mean, that's what happened when uh, Reagan uh, told Menachem Begin to stop the uh, war in Lebanon. Within hours, he's, he stopped. And when President Biden told Bibi to uh, stop the, the, the war in, uh, uh, in, in Gaza about two years ago, and that the runway was up, he stopped. I believe that the president uh, comes out very clearly and says to Hamas, release all the hostages, and uh, we are for a permanent ceasefire, that uh, Will Burns and Secretary Blinken, who I have tremendous uh, respect for, will get it done. President Biden did call Israel's action in Gaza, quote, over the top. But I'm, I'm curious what you think an appropriate response to October 7th would look like. I think it would look like a, uh, Israel getting the Hamas perpetrators, uh, but doing it uh, surgically and doing it uh, in a way uh, after the attacks, for example, of the Munich athletes, how Israel got every single person responsible. But it took many, many years to do that. Uh, and I have always supported uh, Israel's uh, right to get the Hamas perpetrators, but that doesn't mean 
that you have Ben Gavir calling for the full expulsion of the Palestinian people who's sitting in the Israeli war cabinet as uh, their national uh, security uh, minister. Do you think that Israel should pull out of Gaza now, even if Hamas remains in power? I believe that we need to have a, a release of all the hostages by Hamas in a permanent ceasefire. And then I believe the United States should lead uh, the efforts for uh, two states living side by side. And uh, I, I don't think, I think I've called Hamas a terrorist organization. I don't think that Hamas should be part of that uh, governing uh, body, but I think that the United States should lead uh, a two-state solution. Support for Israel amongst progressive Democrats has dropped since the October 7th attack. Do you think that that's a generational change here? Well, look, I have always been a supporter of the U.S.-Israel relationship, the economic relationship in Silicon Valley, the strategic relationship, the cultural relationship. But I think Bibi Netanyahu is doing enormous damage uh, in the perception of young folks and really hurting the relationship. No one has hurt the relationship more than Bibi Netanyahu. Does antipathy to Israel amongst young people scare you? Well, like I said, I've always supported the relationship, and I believe that, that uh, we have to be vigilant against anti-Semitism. Uh, and I introduced a resolution with, uh, with uh, Brian Fitzpatrick against uh, anti-Semitism uh, and have been a very strong uh, voice against anti-Semitism uh, in the United States. Uh, and I uh, support the uh, U.S.-Israel relationship along economic lines, along strategic lines, along cultural lines. Uh, but the reality is that uh, Netanyahu's actions uh, have uh, uh, not taken into account uh, civilian life to the extent that they should. He's been defiant of the president of the United States. He's got cabinet members insulting the president of the United States. Uh, and that has taken a toll uh, on the perception, particularly with young people, but uh, you know Netanyahu is really to blame for that. Uh, obviously, uh, Hamas is to blame uh, solely for October seventh, and they should have been, uh, they should be uh, condemned, and they, they there should have to be action. But Netanyahu has not gone about this the, the, the best way. There are reports that the Biden administration, along with the UK, might seek the recognition of a Palestinian state. Thomas Friedman called, the, called this the Biden doctrine for the Middle East. Is this something that you would support? Yes. And what do you think that would look like? I think we should recognize a, a Palestinian state as a side by side with an Israeli state. And I think we should recognize it uh, in the United Nations and, and, and recognize that uh, we have two states uh, that, that, that we want, that uh, that is uh, the, the solution for peace in the Middle East. Let's move on a bit to 2024. This week we saw Democrats flip George Santos's old seat. So um, is this victory, do you think, a bellwether for Democrats come 2024? It, it's huge. I mean, the, this was the hardest race for us in New York. Other races, we had better demographics, better registration. Uh, Tom Swazi ran a great race. Of course, no one race can predict a trend, but it's certainly a positive sign, and I'm very optimistic we're going to be in the majority in 2024, and that President Biden will be reelected. And what are those top issues that Democrats are running on? Why do you think that you will be able to regain control of the House? One, we're running on reproductive rights and abortion rights. Two, we're running on uh, preserving democratic institutions and uh, making sure that uh, uh, you, you have democratic norms. Three, we're running on the economy, on lowering the cost of prescription drugs, lowering the cost of, uh, uh, of housing, uh, bringing back manufacturing jobs. Let's talk about the economy a bit. As you know, it is a top concern for voters. And according to a recent Pew Research Center survey, only 28% of Americans would categorize the economy as either excellent or good. This is up 9% by since April, but 28% thinking the economy is excellent or good obviously is still low. So what's Democrats pitch about the economy? Well, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, the rents are too high, that housing costs are too high, grocery bills are still too high, that the president has done an extraordinary job in bringing manufacturing, good paying jobs back, but we need to do more to lower costs. And then we say, here's our plan. 
We pushed for lowering prescription drug costs, and we're going to do even more. Uh, we pushed for universal child care. The Republicans stood in the way. We will get child care covered. We pushed to forgive student loans to bring down those costs. We're going to push for building more housing and a rent cap so that housing costs come down. The Republican plan is to give tax cuts to the very, very wealthy. And who do you think is going to do more for working class Americans to bring down costs? And I, I think we have to win that argument. How do you win that argument, though? Because January CPI report indicated that inflation was much higher than anticipated. So how do you say to voters, hey, our economy as Democrats is better than a Republican economy when their wallets don't feel that way? Well, because the uh, Republican plan is to give tax cuts to the very, very wealthy. Uh, and uh, our plan is to put more money in the pockets of the working class. We did that when we gave stimulus checks. We did that when we gave the child tax credit. That is going to go after uh, bringing down rent costs. We're the party that's going to bring down housing costs. We're the party that's going to bring down child care costs. So I think we share what our agenda is. Now, uh, obviously, we acknowledge that the pandemic caused inflation. That inflation uh, was a result of both of the Trump and uh, Biden administrations. And, and I don't think it's... Uh, uh, fair to, to blame, uh, just like I wouldn't blame Donald Trump, I don't blame Joe Biden. That was because of the pandemic and we had to have a response. But the question is going forward, who's going to have a, uh, a better uh, uh, plan to uh, lower costs? And, and I think Democrats do. I have felt really lucky in my position here. I've been able to talk to voters all throughout the country, and their top concern across the board is when I go to the grocery store, when I get everyday items, they are simply more expensive than in years past. And Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said in the Senate last week that prices are unlikely to fall. So do you think that that will alienate voters? No, I think we have to acknowledge that voters are right, that uh, the, the costs are higher. I mean, first of all, even if you have uh, inflation rate falling, uh, there was inflation. So by definition, the price of milk, the price of eggs, the price of gas is higher than it used to be. And I think what voters don't like is that people are uh, not honest about that. You have to acknowledge the pain, the hardship. And then you say, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put more money in your pockets with the child tax credit. We're going to lower your rent because we're going to build more rental housing and we're going to have a rent cap so it doesn't go higher than inflation. We're going to make sure that you don't have to have child care costs. We're going to push uh, for universal child care. We're going to reduce your cost of prescription drug. And I think then they're willing to give to, to listen. Congressman, I want to talk about your economic vision in particular. You've pitched in the past a new economic patriotism. Can you explain what that is? New economic patriotism means that we uh, invest in the reindustrialization of America. We need to make steel again in America, clean steel. In Johnstown, Pennsylvania, in Warren, Ohio, downriver Michigan, I'm introducing a bill to make aluminum again in America. We shouldn't have let all of that go to China. We need to make new industry in every congressional district in America. We need a self-reliance. That doesn't mean that we disengage from the global economy, but it means that we should be able to make basic things in America and have good paying manufacturing jobs. But it also means that we need the good paying, high paying tech jobs, finance jobs in every district in this country where every community, black and white and Hispanic, south and north has the opportunity for intergenerational wealth uh, and wealth creation. And a lot of my work has been creating that economic opportunity across this country in every district across America. Congressman, the pitch to make things in America again sounds like something Republicans and Democrats alike can get behind. How are you in this push? Are you at the beginning, middle? What does this look like? Well, it has been something that we've had bipartisan appeal. Senator Rubio and I worked to create a National Economic Development Council uh, legislation to actually build things in every congressional district. Senator Young and I were working on the CHIPS Act together to build semiconductor manufacturing. I believe there'll be a number of Republicans who support my effort to bring steel back to America and have clean steel. This is why I call it a new economic patriotism. There are a lot of issues that there may not, we may not see across the aisle the same way. Abortion, differences of uh, opinion. Uh, Israel-Palestine, differences of opinion. Ukraine, differences of opinion. But making America the strongest economy, making us a manufacturing superpower, making us an economic power in every district, that's something all Americans can get behind. Why don't we do that to try to bring this country together? 
That sounds like something Democrat, Democratic and Republican voters can get behind. And I want to talk about your future in particular. You didn't run for Senate, but you have been floated as a possible successor to Bernie uh, Sanders as a progressive presidential <laughs> contender. So do you see yourself eventually in the Oval Office? I, I see myself right now uh, going back to California and doing everything I can to elect President Biden. But I, I'll say this. I, I think there's going to be a new generation uh, after this election. And I think this country is desperate for a new generation that's going to work together to fix problems and move this country forward and not have the kind of vitriol that we see going into communities and treating people with respect, even if you disagree with them, figuring out a common vision for this country. And I want to be part of that. And I, I don't know in what role that'll be. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, not everyone has to be the quarterback. It, it, the team needs uh, wide receivers and offensive linemen, and we'll figure that out when we go. But I do believe that a vision for economic development is the right vision for this country. So you're not ruling out a potential presidential run in the future? I don't rule out anything. I mean, I've never ruled out anything, but I'm not ruling it in either. I, you know, you never close any doors in life, but I, but my focus right now is uh, doing my job, which is a very important job, representing Silicon Valley, $10 trillion of market value, and uh, helping bring, bring economic opportunity to other parts of the country. And I'm very passionate about the steel bill that uh, I believe we can rebuild steel in America, hydrogen powered, direct reduction iron. I'd love to get that done, uh, hopefully with President Biden in 2025, but whoever's president, I'd love to get it done. No matter what happens in 2024, you do bring up a good point. Like I said earlier, I have had the opportunity to talk to voters all throughout the country, and they are looking for the future. No one is exactly thrilled about this 2020 rematch on either side of the aisle. So what do you think the new generation looks like in the Democratic Party come 2028? I think it's a generation that's going to bring the whole new energy, new ideas, new uh, economic ideas, and it's not going to be... Uh, burdened by some of the age-old uh, anger and division and, uh, and grudges. I think we can uh, work where we disagree with people uh, philosophically on principle, but it doesn't uh, hopefully become personal. And uh, we don't have uh, uh, just hearings of uh, investigations where we're really focused on moving the country forward. Uh, I'm, I'm ready for a new generation of leaders. I believe that this is uh, kind of the last hurrah of the, the baby boomers in solid generation. Uh, and uh, hopefully, and I'm pretty confident we're going to turn the page after this as a country. We need to after this turn the page as a country. And as you know, President Biden is a more moderate Democrat. Do you see the future of the Democratic Party being more progressive? I do. I'm a proud progressive Democrat, but I, I, I think these labels sometimes can uh, be, uh, you know, boxing people in. I mean, I'm progressive because I believe that the American dream has slipped away from too many Americans, that there's too much of a concentration of wealth in some places and too many people have been left out. And we need a real economic vision that gives people a shot at the American dream again. And that means having a new economic bill of rights. It means giving people housing and health care and education, but it also means giving them the opportunity to be in good manufacturing jobs or good uh, technology jobs or good service jobs that is going to pay a good way. That to me is what a progressive Democrat means. And I'll look forward to sharing my ideas and hopefully convincing people and where we disagree, finding a good compromise to move this country forward. Congressman, if there is more movement on your steel bill, or rather when there is more movement, I hope you come on back and talk about it with me. Congressman Rokana, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. A real pleasure.